Hello everybody and welcome to another exciting tutorial in Maya 2017. It's great to have you all here and thanks for taking the time to tuning into these videos every week. It's been absolutely fantastic seeing um, how many people are actually interested in learning like the very basics of Maya as well. There's a lot of great tutorials on YouTube as well, so I'm very happy that you guys have taken the time to actually come here and learn a little bit with me every week. And today we're all going to be talking about shaders and specifically creating realistic looking materials inside of Arnold in Maya 2017. So it's a great tool set that we've got ahead for you guys today. There is going to be a few things that we're going to have to set up in terms of making some lights, making some Maya materials through Arnold using the Arnold standard shader, and then talking about how we can customize and debug certain problems inside of the Arnold renderer in order to create these type of materials. So with that, let's get started. Okay, so before we can get started in actually seeing some of the effects of the shaders in Arnold inside of our scene, we have to start building a little bit of an environment for our Maya project. Now, I currently have some basic objects which are inside of my scene over here, a little bottle with a little modeled version of the liquid that's inside of that bottle, and this little helmet over here. So we're going to be talking about how to make some glass and reflective and uh, transparent type of textures here, and how to make some more metallic textures over here but to see these metallic uh, light uh, uh, sorry these metallic and glass type of effects we really need to have some form of environment to be reflected inside of our scene to do that what we're going to do is that we are going to set up a Arnold environment light if we come over here and go into Arnold lights and we look for a sky dome light which will create a little environment inside of our scene and this type of light one of the handy things about it is that we can use an HDR image to actually start lighting our scene because if I come over here into the render view and I start lighting things up over here, you're going to see that we get this wonderful kind of like diffuse white light that comes from this material over here. Now, the light that's inside of Arnold by default, you'll see doesn't generate any type of background per se. So we're going to have some lighting in here, but the background over here is going to be all in black. So we're going to have to add in an environment shader in just a sec as well. So what I'm going to do is inside the properties of my AI Skydome light, I'm going to go into color and I'm going to look for a file node. And inside the file node, I'm going to look for an HDR that I have actually saved previously, which is this Ditch River 2K HDR over here. And if I open that up over there, you'll see that it looks like in the viewport it's created some form of environment. But again, if I do a little quick test render, you're going to see very quickly that I've now got some lighting and some shadows coming from my HDR, which is pretty cool. Uh, but the environment is still completely dark like this. Now, if you're wondering where you can get an HDR for this project, unfortunately, I don't own these HDRs. I made a version of this tutorial last year for Mental Ray, which is also available on the channel that you guys can check out. But there's this great website called hdrlabs.com. And inside their smart IBL, their image-based lighting resources, inside the archive submenu, they have a whole series of free HDRs that you can download and use for your little projects. And I downloaded this Ditch River project over here just to create this light which is in here. The very cool thing about an HDR is that depending on its resolution, this is an exterior scene, as you can see, kind of like and you can see that there's a sun over there in the distance, if I just get my camera into the right angle like that. And actually the light, which is inside of this image, because it has multiple exposures, it's actually generating the real world shadows that were present inside of this HDR image. It's a very cool technology, very worthwhile finding out how it works uh, to become a good 3D artist. But let's start tackling now the problem of the background, because one, We've set ourselves up our light, which is absolutely great. If I come over here, another thing we can do is increase the resolution of this image. This is a 2K HDR, so I can boost that up to a, a value of 2000. And again, this resolution is pretty much how accurate 
Arnold is going to use this HDR in terms of how to calculate its light. But you see, even with a very low resolution, it actually was working really, really, really well. To create an environment background, we have to create another little kind of like spherical background like this one, but this one's actually going to appear in our render scene. And to do that, we're going to have to come into the render settings inside of Maya over here, scroll over to the Arnold renderer tab, and inside the environment settings, there's a little tab here, which is called background. Now, inside of this background tab, what I want to do is select it on this little checker pattern and choose create sky shader with a left click. And there we go, it's going to create another sphere over here, which will allow us to insert another image. So by default now, I've just created a AI sky shader, which what it's going to do is pretty much put a background color into my image like such. And Arnold being Arnold, one of the wonderful things that it does is that the light that's in the environment is slightly inherited into our scene like this as well. So to avoid clashing the light between the environment shader and the light shader, which we've got in here, what we're going to do is set up some settings. If I open the render stats, it's really important for today that you turn cast shadows off in the AI sky shader and you turn it off to be visible in the diffuse and turn it off to be visible in the glossy. Specifically because I'm going to be rendering reflections, I will want it to be visible in the reflections and visible in the refractions as well, just in case Arnold actually needs those to actually be accurate. So as we go making glass and other materials, we can hopefully still see those there. But you should be able to turn off the shadows, the diffuse and the glossy fairly easily like that. So with that all set, we do the same thing. We just add into the color swatch over here, the HDR over here. And if I scroll down to my file node over here and I navigate again inside my project settings and I look for my Ditch River HDR over here and I hit open, I'm going to be able now to hopefully render out my scene like this. And fingers crossed, now I've got an environment background really cool like that. And then I'm also going to have the actual light from this HDR set up inside of my scene as well. So this HDR image is being used in two different shaders. And one of the things that's going to be important for us today is that we're going to be rendering some stuff out in the um, Maya renderer per se, but I'm also going to be turning on the Arnold render view at specific points. And you also hear the fans of my computer kick in a lot today as well, so I apologize because there's going to be a lot of background processing for this tutorial as well. If I turn on the Arnold render view over here and I render this same shot out and I just give it a few seconds for it to actually render out like this, you're going to notice that there's a difference between this image and this image over here. And you might be wondering why one looks darker and the other one looks lighter. The reason for that is that by default, Maya's render view has color correction turned on. When we're rendering things out inside of 3D, sometimes we want to be rendering out the raw image. And this raw image has no color correction of any sorts added onto it. So this image that we see here on the left in this little tab up here actually has this sRGB gamma setting turned on. And if I switch from this color mode into raw, you're going to see that now the color is exactly the same. So actually, when we're rendering things out through the render view, we're color correcting it ever so slightly by adding a gamma curve on top of the original image. So the reason for this is to display the image slightly more pleasing to how most monitors would actually see the image. And the real re reason to render things out color corrected or non color corrected is very much along the lines of if you are mastering or you know that you're going to be editing this image in inside of Photoshop or inside of Nuke, you probably want to keep the maximum color depth that this raw image can hold, which is very much the same way as a raw image inside of a photo cam uh, camera. However, if you're rendering and that output is going to go directly, say, into the web, or it's not really going to be color corrected at all, you want a very kind of like dangerous, I just push the render button and this is what my final image looks like, you'll probably want to have some sort of color correction on top of it over here. But please beware that when you're saving things in Maya, and I go to File, Save Image, there always is an option for me to choose if I'm saving the raw image, this one over here, 
or if I'm saving the color managed image, which has its gamma curve corrected onto it. It's part of a personal choice in terms of what you're going to be doing with the image after you've finished rendering it. But please be aware that there are these two very specific ways of thinking about your images, basically in raw mode or in their color corrected version. So with that, now that we've got an environment, let's start setting up our shaders for creating our glass material. To create the glass material, I'm going to select my geometry over here and I'm going to open up the Maya Hypershade by clicking the Hypershade button or going into Windows, Rendering Editors, Hypershade. Once I'm inside the Hypershade, I'm going to create a new Arnold shader and I'm going to create an AI S, a little typing in here, and I'm going to look for an AI standard shader, which is the Arnold standard shader. I'm going to click on the show inputs and outputs button over here so I can actually see the material over here. And I'm going to call this glass over here. And you'll see that my render nodes over here basically update with their name like such. Now, this material over here is going to be applied to this bottle over here. And I can middle mouse button click from the actual material node over here into my scene over here to actually see this material applied to this little bottle over here. Now there's a few technical setup things that we need to do with this, but first of all, let's start playing around with the settings of the glass. One of the things that we've got inside of the Hypershade inside of Maya 2017, which is really useful, is that I can use the same type of HDR lighting that I have in my Maya scene inside of this material viewer over here. And if I'm gonna be making a material that has any type of reflectiveness or refractiveness glass effectively, we're going to benefit if we can actually turn on one of these color profiles over here. And you'll see that we get this interior lighting type of model, which is really, really handy. So what I'm going to do is come over here and start looking at some of the properties which are inside the Hypershade. Now, specifically glass, because it's transparent, doesn't really have any properties that are important in the diffuse channel. The color of my glass isn't really driven by this, it's driven by another property per se. So you could perfectly turn these down to zero and you would be absolutely fine. However, glass does have two key components. One component is that glass is very refractive, so it's gonna have some specular properties, and down at the bottom, it's also going to have reflective properties, sorry, not reflective, refractive properties over there, one next to the other, reflection, refraction, don't confuse the two. So the refraction is gonna control the transparency of the object, and the specular is gonna uh, control how much of the environment can be seen in this material. So one of the things that we can do straight away is that if I bring up the specular property over here and I boost it up to one, you're gonna see that this material becomes really, 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 really shiny. It almost looks like as if it was made out of metal. And if I take the roughness of this material over here and I boost it up, you would see that the reflection becomes softer and softer and softer. And if I bring the roughness down, you're going to see that it's going to become really, really, really reflective. That's a lot of specularity. And it's going to cast a reflection of this environment, per se. So you're going to see that this uh, model is kind of like fairly true to how glass would behave. One of the things that we want to do is make sure that we turn on another property inside of our glass, which is the Fresnel over here. And Fresnel reflections are pretty much, if I turn them on over here, you're going to see that the look of this is going to change quite a lot, because now what's going to happen is that the reflections are only on the edges of this sphere over here. Specifically, the Fresnel um, algorithms, what they do is that they cause those reflections to appear based on the point of view of the camera inside of Maya. So it's very handy for us to define that as we see over here. And if we wanted to, we could tweak the reflectance at normal property down here so we could make the object kind of like reflect just a little bit more of the environment just like that. The same way that if we played around with the roughness, we could blur those type of reflections just a little bit as well if we wanted to. So I'm gonna leave these reflectance at normals at very low value over here of 0.024. 
And then I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to start playing around with the refractive properties over here. So inside here, what we need to do is start increasing the effect of the refraction. So I'm going to boost up this weight property and you're going to see that progressively, little by little, little by little, my glass is going to become more and more transparent as you see like such. Okay. Now the glass over here, it's looking fairly nice right now, but one of the properties that glass has is this index of refraction over here. And the index of refraction is how much the light bends as it moves through the object. You've probably seen images of a glass holding some water and a straw going through it and the straw bends. That's what the index of refraction is all about. Importantly, I'm going to change the index of refraction to match the index of refraction of glass, which is 1.51, roughly, if I remember correctly. And you're going to see that that's going to cause the light inside of this bubble over here to actually bend accordingly. The index of refraction is specific to every single type of material. So water will have its own index of refraction, glass will have its own index of refraction, you can look at these by actually Googling IOR and whatever material you're actually interested in making, and that will give you the physically accurate settings over here. Now again, we can turn on Fresnel index of refraction as well, so that the refraction is different based on the angle of view as well. And this is a great starting point for me to actually go ahead and do a little test render to see what my material actually looks like. Now, inside my viewport, you'll notice that if I turn on the Show Textures button inside of Maya, that nothing's really going to happen with this bottle over here because it requires the shader, the actual real-world lighting, to actually have an impact in what we see inside of this image over here. So at this stage, as I mentioned, it's a good time for me to do a little test render over here and see what my material is looking like. Now again, you might get unexpected results with these renders, and it's good for us to start debugging what is actually happening with each one of these renders over here. So you'll notice that the outside of my bottle seems to be rendered out, but the inside of it actually appears to be dark. And also, you'll notice that my shadows over here are actually fairly solid and opaque as well. These shadows should actually be transparent as they go through the glass material. Well, fortunately for us, all of these problems are resolvable, but we have to do a little bit of testing and debugging. So this material over here, first of all, why is it appearing black? Well, Arnold has lots of settings in terms of how it controls its, prop uh, its properties. Specifically, inside the Arnold render uh, properties and the render settings, you'll see that there's um, some sliders that we've been using previously to control the quality of how accurate the Arnold renderer is being. However, there also is a property over here which is very important for glass, which is called ray depth. And the ray depth is basically calculating how many surfaces are the light objects, go uh, the light photons going through in order for them to actually render. If I turn on a wireframe version of this material, it might be a little bit hard for you guys to see on your screens at home, but you're going to notice that the inside and the outside of this bottle have been modeled. So it's got an exterior face, it's got an interior face, there's a liquid object which is inside here, and then there's another interior face and another exterior face over here. So for the light to actually go through the object, it actually has to go through multiple surfaces and that's the reason why we can't actually see the shader actually performing this view all the way through. If I increase the number of ray depth uh, uh, rays over here to basically have a distance of six for now over here and I make sure that I type that into the refractive property over here and I press my render button again to do a very quick test render. The render time might go up a little bit because we're increasing the amount of the calculations which are going through here but now we're going to start seeing the effect that successfully we have created now enough ray depth for the actual uh, glass bottle to, for us to be actually be able to see through it. 
Now, there is another object inside of the bottle, because I did model uh, an object for the liquid, which is also inside of the bottle over here. And you'll notice that, hey presto, we can actually see through the bottle, but wherever it's interfacing with the liquid, we can't see anything yet because we haven't built that shader and we haven't set up its properties. So this is kind of like a nice kind of like milk bottle type of look over here. But what about the shadows over here? Now, these shadows down here are gonna have to be semi-transparent as well because they're going through a transparent object. But Arnold by default has a property that you need to turn on manually. If I select my bottle object in here, you're gonna notice that there is inside of my attribute editor a property called wine bottle shape. And if you need to press control A to get to the attribute editor, just do it with a tap. Inside the Arnold, uh, pro uh, tab down here, if we scroll down, we'll see that there's a property which is called opaque. And if we're making objects that are transparent in nature, we're going to have to turn that opaque property off on every object that would have that property. So if I come over here now and I'm going to press the little clapperboard with the eye to bring up my previous render view, another very handy tool which is inside the Maya render view is this little checker pattern view over here, which allows, uh, sorry, not checker pattern, bounding box type of view over here, which allows me to click and drag onto an area of my image over here. So I can just click and drag to select an area down here. And when I press this little clapperboard with the bounding box, it's only going to render out the pixels that are inside this bounding box, making my render time for my tests much, much, much faster. So now you'll notice that the uh, shadows over here, except for the shadows of the liquid, because we haven't turned those off yet, have actually completely and utterly disappeared. So it's important for us all of a sudden to realize that this material over here is going to be perfectly transparent because the color of this bottle is kind of like glassy and kind of like too perfectly transparent. I need to add a little property to this glass for this um, the shadows to start appearing again inside of my render view. And that's a property that's called transmittance. So if I come into my hypershade one more time, again, I'm gonna keep dancing around with these views over here. And actually my render view has now started cropping up with the material viewer for some bizarre reason. There we go. I'm just gonna leave this over here. And I'm gonna come into the glass property again. I'm gonna scroll down to the reflect uh, the refraction tab. I'm gonna say reflection all the time, I know it. Uh, inside the refraction tab over here, we can add a color to our liquids or glass by changing their transmittance property. Be careful not to confuse it with the color property because if I click on the color property and let's say if I chose green for the color of the bottle of my bottle, you're going to see that this color green is kind of like applied to the entire material uniformly, which is not physically accurate. If I had a material that had different widths in it, I could vary the amount of how much the liquid is being kind of like affected by the color of the particles inside of it. And with transmittance, if I click on the green, you're gonna see that I get a very similar result, but the transmittance is gonna allow me a much finer control over the look of the actual liquid and make it a little bit more physically accurate like that. I'm gonna go for something that's kind of like mediumly saturated so that you guys can actually see what it looks like inside of my scene. And with the transmittance, I have to be a little bit careful as well because if I do a render now, I'm gonna see if the transmittance is actually working or if I get any type of bugs or errors inside of it as well. Sometimes when you're choosing like specific colors, it causes a little bit of interference with the colors that you would see on the inside of your material, as you can see over here. But fortunately, it seems like everything's okay. And now that I've got my ray de depth set up correctly, and I've now got some green glass, I hopefully should start seeing a little bit of green transparent shadows appearing on the actual plinth down here at the bottom, which is absolutely perfect, which is exactly what I wanted. So there we go, we have ourselves a very, very, very simple glass material made over here. Nice green bottle over here, you could choose any color that you'd want to as well. But this is physically accurate as well, and as the material has different 
thicknesses near the top of the bottle and near the bottom of the bottle over here, you're going to see in the areas where the glass is thicker, it's going to have more of that green color, and areas where that glass is thin, it's going to have a lot less of that green color as well. So with that, we get into a good stage for us to start designing what this liquid is going to look like, and that's going to be very, 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 very similar to creating a glass material, but just changing the color which is inside here. So let's go ahead and do that now. So with our glass all set up, let's go ahead and start building the actual wine material. So I'm going to press Control H on my keyboard to hide away the bottle temporarily, and I'm going to select the actual object which is been modeled over here, and if you see in shaded mode, I've actually modeled what the shape of the of the wine actually looks like. An interesting thing about Arnold is that Arnold allows you to have the actual liquid inside of the glass bottle modeled as a single object. So the top with a little bit of modeling of the surface tension and the sides are all modeled just like a little squashed cylinder like this. The fun thing about this as well is that this material per se is visible kind of like with the normals on the top and the sides pointing outwards as well. So because this liquid, kind of like we're only interested in the outside shape of it, this is what we're gonna have to texture. And as I told you before, one of the things that we're gonna have to do, because this also will have transparent type of shadows, is to turn off the opaque property straight away. So let's go ahead and let's build ourselves a new shader inside of here. And because I'm working with multiple objects which are similar, I've got my glass object over here inside of my shading network and I'm going to show you guys a new little trick inside of here which is that if I'm inside the workspace over here and I press tab on my keyboard I can actually bring up this little text bar over here which if I press A I S I can look for an AI standard shader and when I press enter it's going to create a new shader network for me alongside my glass material over here so I'm going to call this wine or liquid, what I prefer. There we go, I'm just gonna call it wine per se. And I'm gonna start doing the same type of setup that I did for the glass, only thinking about what would a wine type of material actually look like. Well, I can come into here, and again, I can turn off the actual diffuse properties over here. I can come down into the specular properties, and again, we're going to increase the specular weight to one. We're gonna reduce the roughness to just a little bit less than a zero over here. And then I'm also gonna turn on those Fresnel reflections that I was talking to you guys about before. I'm not interested at the reflectance at normal at all because I actually wanna see perfectly through the actual uh, liquid itself if I'm looking onto it. And if I look at the refraction tab over here, again, here is where we're gonna start playing around with the weight of the refractivity, making that object transparent. The index of refraction for the wine is going to be similar to that of water, which is going to be 1.33. I think you could use the index of refraction for alcohol as well, which I think is 1.4, but I could be wrong on that. So just double check that with a Google search if you want to. 1.33 should be fine. And then what I'm going to do is come into here and again turn on the Fresnel index of refraction as well. And inside the transmittance, is where I'm going to start choosing the color for my wine. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to start off with a very <laughs> saturated red. As you can see, that's a little bit too far for my liking. But what it's going to allow me to do is very quickly move this red color into the magenta type of colors over here. And you could choose to have red wine, white wine, rosé, uh, choose your favorite, whatever, uh, whatever you like. But I'm going to choose kind of like this nice kind of like slightly darkish, red, which is just kind of like a little bit balanced into the magenta as well. Being no connoisseur in wine myself, that's kind of like what I think I pick up when I'm at the supermarket or something. So again, that's kind of like the color that I would expect my wine to look like thanks to this fantastic interactive viewport inside of the material viewer. So now my wine is kind of like almost ready. In many cases, you can just apply this to the actual uh, object and you'd be absolutely fine. Again, it would be another good time for us to do a little test render as well. And remember, you can middle mouse button drag onto your material over here and do that little test render if you want. But one of the properties that I want to add 
is I want to come into here into the subsurface scattering panel over here and I just want to add a tiny, 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 tiny amount of subsurface scattering because currently this material you can see perfectly through it and although there are wines which are like that what I'm going to do is color this wine with the most recent color that I've actually used you'll see that currently there's not much of an effect but as I start increasing the subsurface scattering you're going to see that this object is going to become just a little bit brighter as it captures light and one of the things you're going to notice as the renderer goes finishing off is that now this isn't perfectly transparent. This is going to be a very, very, very subtle effect. If I crank this up to the max, you're going to see that you get a very kind of like glowing type of material, which would be a very different effect than what we're looking for. But you're going to see that you're going to lose all of the transparency in the object. And it's going to have this murky type of translucent type of look where there's still light going through the object but there's little impurities and little particles which are stopping the light from moving forward. I think like a value of 0.1 will be absolutely fine for us over here so that the wine is kind of like just a little, little, little bit not so transparent anymore. With that, we've added a few little impurities and made that liquid just look a little bit more translucent rather than transparent. So with that material all done over here, it's a good time for me to come over, close my hypershade down, and I'm going to do a very quick test render over here and see what I can come up with. You're going to see that my render times are going to get progressively longer and longer. And this has actually created a really nice looking material that took just about 33 seconds to actually render. In Arnold at this stage, because I'm testing things and making changes, I'm not really concerned about all of this background noise over here. Later on, we can go into my render settings and we can bump up the anti-aliasing and the different properties over here just to make our uh, materials kind of like smoother and basically soften out the shadows and everything else like that. But for now, for testing, all of this is absolutely great. And you'll see that I've been very successful at making a material that kind of looks like wine. Again, we're going to see these wonderful kind of like changes of color thanks to the tra uh, transmittance property and also the fact that the wine is ever so slightly kind of like cloudy thanks to that subsurface scattering inside of the uh, materials. You'll see that Arnold does a great, great, great job at making these physically accurate materials. But now comes the tricky part, which I'm going to switch over to the interactive render mode, because one of the things that's going to happen now is that I want to see what happens when we combine both of the objects inside of my scene. So if I come into my Windows Outliner and I look for my... A wine bottle which is currently hidden and I press shift H to bring it back into my render view here's where I'm gonna have to have again I'm just gonna double check that I have my wine object selected because now I have to mess around with the shape of the wine object itself to actually allow me to see how I can actually make this look a little bit more realistic so let's go ahead and bring up the Arnold render view over here. It's going to catch my scene in just a few seconds, and you're going to see that very quickly it's going to give me a progressive look over here. Uh, so you guys can see this a little bit clearer. I'm going to increase the exposure of my image by 0.3 over here to just make it a little bit clearer in the image so that you guys can see this happening over here. And another thing that I can do inside of the Arnold render view as well is that I have this little square next to the exposure panel over here. And if I click on this, I can actually draw around the actual box over here and you'll see that this bounding box very much works like the Maya render view as well. It's going to concentrate all of its efforts in rendering out this image over here. So importantly for me, I'm just going to wait for a second and pause the video so that I can show you something. What's going to happen is that currently I can see a little gap in between the glass and the liquid over here. And in actual physical properties, what would happen is that this material over here, actually because of the refraction of the glass plus the refraction of the wine inside it, this wine material should actually almost be touching the outside of the glass over here. 
The way that Arnold deals with this is that it actually asks us to actually scale up our um, glass just a little bit more, sorry, our liquid a little bit more towards the edge of the glass. So I'm going to turn on the interactive render view over here, and I'm going to use the scale tool inside of Maya, and I'm just going to scale uniformly this material up, 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 and at one point when it gets close to the glass, you're going to see that I'm going to get this little type of interference going on over here. If you want to be really, really, really precise, switch from the perspective view into the orthographic view. And let's choose one of the side views like this, where I can see that the glass is not actually intersecting the outer ring of the actual bottle. So again, if I made this a lot bigger, at one point when it's past the glass, you're going to see that Arnold is now rendering out a little bit better, but it's going to have this little thin kind of like interference in between the two objects. So what I need to do is make sure that my bottle, uh, uh, my liquid, is somewhere in between the inside and the outside of the bottle, causing as little overlap as possible. So I'm going to scale it in the Y axis like this, so that it's actually inside like that. And then I'm just going to wait for a second, see what my render view actually shows me. And at one point, just by scaling this at one point, I should be able to get it to a point where I can see the actual liquid touching the sides and hopefully no type of interference from the shader over here. So I'm just going to give that a little twirl to see how it goes and I'll come back in a sec. So you're going to see that it's going to be a little bit tricky to kind of like get it just in the right place. But as long as the liquid is in between the geometry of the outside of the bottle and the inside of the bottle, you should start seeing that the liquid actually does refract actually to touch the outside of the actual bowl just like this. Again, turning on shaded view, you see that all of these kind of like uh, pieces of geometry are actually being kind of like rendered out thanks to the wonderful, wonderful shaders inside of Arnold. Now, we've used two materials right now, and I'm also going to show you how to uh, create a material on a specific selection of the actual wine bottle as well. So one of the things that I can do is that I can select my face selection mode over here and I'll choose round about here, I believe, to kind of like select like four little squares like this. I'm going to press a shift and the period key to grow my selection. And then I'm gonna come over here and I'm going to select a series of faces over here, and I'm going to insert a new material into this face selection over here. So I'm going to go back to the hypershade for a second, and I'm going to again build myself a new shader connected to this bottle over here. So what I'm going to do again is use the tab key and bring up AIS, choose AI standard shader, press enter to bring up a new texture node. And this is going to be a little label that I am going to add into my scene over here. So I'm going to come over here, select a material, go into file over here. And over here, I'm going to select inside of the folder structure over here, I'm going to look down and I have a wine label dot JPEG over here, I'm going to insert this into my selection over here. So to do this, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to re-enable this material and call it label like that. And then I'm going to come over again into my shade over here. And actually, I'll just have to do that selection very quickly again, because I'd actually created my selection over there. Mm, yeah, I think I'll just do I think I just want to actually see a little bit more of that material over there. So actually what I'm going to do is choose my selection to be a little bit off to the side like that just so that I can actually see the shader that I made before and have kind of like the helmet kind of like there on the corner. And with this selected over here, I can go into my label shader, right click on it and choose assign material to selection. And what that's going to do is that it's going to add a texture only onto this material over here. And if I choose my select kind of like texture, uh, display texture 
uh, viewport uh, filter over here, it will display like this. Now my texture looks really, 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 really distorted like this. So one of the things that I need to do is that I will have to be laying out some UVs per se. Now, as you can see, my bottle hasn't got any UVs laid out right now that can bring some problems down the line if I wanted to, but you can create your UVs at any section that you want. If I right click on UVs and I choose UV shell, I should be able to, oops, maybe not. I'm gonna come into object mode over here. I'd made a slightly different selection than last time. So again, what I'm gonna do is make sure that I have my object selected by going into object mode. Object mode, there we go. Click on my bottle like this. Go back into face mode. And I'm gonna do again the same selection one more time, which hopefully with the keyboard shortcuts is not really that long for me to actually be able to do. So I've got all of these faces selected over here and I'm gonna go into my UV menu and I am going to do a planar projection over here. And you're gonna see that that's gonna take my UVs and lay them out inside of this UV tile. I'm gonna then rotate this label using the rotate tools over there several times and that's what's gonna allow me to actually have my um, label printed on the side of my wine bottle over there. Now I could unwrap the rest of the UVs for now and I'd encourage you guys to do that in your own time as well, just in case you wanted to add any other texture like bumps and other type of effects onto the glass as well. Remember you have to have UVs in order to be able to display bitmap type of textures over here. Now if i am uh, got my little kind of like bottle all set up over here, the last thing I wanna do with my material is just double check that my settings have something quite reasonable. And you'll notice that there's this red kind of like box around my hypershade just because that window actually needs to refresh over here. I'm just gonna open it up and there we go. My texture has now been refreshed over here and I can actually come into maybe something that's shadable or maybe my plane over here just to see the texture itself. And I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna click on my label properties over here. And the thing that I want to do is make sure that my specular weight, uh, sorry, my diffuse weight is all right. And I might just give it a little bit of a specular glow over here. Nowhere near as much as the actual um, bottle itself, but instead of having something that has a very smooth roughness per se, this is going to have a very high roughness per se because it's going to be very soft and diffuse like that. And again, this is another good time for me to do a little test render over here and let's see what came out. So you're going to see that we've been quite successful at creating a um, glass shader and some liquids and a little label on the top. Thanks to getting those properties just right, they all seem to belong in the same world. Now, there's still a lot of precision that needs to be increased in the quality of the actual render as well, but these test renders are coming out at just 30 seconds each, which is actually quite a good speed in terms of keeping things kind of like rolling forward. Another thing that I could do in terms of increasing my performance as well is that I could come over here and I could start hiding some of these objects away so by pressing Control H on them so that my the next material kind of like will render out just a little bit faster because it's not going to be visible anymore inside of the render view and you'll see that very quickly we should be able to kind of like come here and we'll have a render that will just take a couple of seconds now because the bottle has been excluded from my render as well so keep kind of like always in mind that you can hide things away and bring them back as you need to but let's start creating a new metal texture for this helmet over here. Now, metals specifically, whoops, I didn't want to click on my renderer. I wanted to go into the hypershade over here. So let's just bring up my hypershade. Uh, one of the cool things that we can do inside of the hypershade inside of my 2017 in terms of making my renders, I'm just going to turn this off for one second. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to click on this tab button over here. And this tab is going to allow me to rename different workspaces. So I'm going to call this metals over here. And I can start building a complex shading network just for this one material, just to keep everything slightly more organized. So I can come over here and I'm gonna start again with the Arnold Standard Material. And inside the Arnold Standard Material, again, we've got a good base of tools to start working with in order to create different types of metals. Now, if I'm going to create a metal 
specifically, there's various properties that I will have to play around with. Of course, on one side, we're going to have to have some form of diffuse color. I'm going to change my shader ball to actually be a sphere, per se. And if I wanted to choose something like a golden type of metal or some, uh, something along those lines, I could start off with a very simple base color over here, kind of like this dark type of yellow orangish color. And then I could start adding in more properties, specifically start playing around with the specularity of that material. So if I bring back my HDRs one more time, just so that things start illuminating, I can now start bringing up the weight of this metal over here. And you're gonna see that this floods the whole metal kind of like with, again, this reflective surface, which if I drag it down, 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 if I drag the roughness down so that it's amazingly smooth, you're gonna see that we've got this very highly polished type of material over here. Now, one of the important things is that we've got this base color over here. And again, that material will actually have a weight to it, which I can crank up to a little bit less than one over here. And what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna start adding in a specular color to this material. So if I came over here and I changed the specular color to actually be slightly more golden like this, you're gonna see that we're gonna start creating a material that looks a little bit more like a golden metal, per se. So the color of the highlight of the metal is always closely, closely, closely related to the color of the diffuse as well. If we had copper, we would have an orange highlight. If we had silver, we would have a whitish or slightly bluish type of highlight added to it as well, because metals tend to reflect the color that they actually kind of like have polished. So metals will have many combinations and flavors to them as well. Sometimes they can be highly glossy type of materials like this one over here, or sometimes they can be of a slightly matter finish. It depends on how they've actually been machined together. Uh, one of the important things for us is that if we were gonna make a material that wasn't kind of like so shiny and polished as this one, uh, we'd probably be dropping the diffuse weight down a little bit as well, and that's gonna make the colors kind of like a little bit more muted in here. The roughness at 0.4 should be fine. Uh, but one of the things we'd do with the specular channel is we'd start dialing down its weight and its roughness. And if I chose like 0.4 for the weight over here, and I chose a roughness of about 0.4 as well, you're gonna see that we get a very different type of look. We've no longer got the golden polished type of look, but we've got kind of like a much more kind of like softer type of reflected material as well. Uh, one of the things to do specifically with materials like this as well is that they will have a Fresnel reflection to them as well, but even though it seems very weird that now there's only kind of like highlights on the side, boost up the reflectance at normal to one, and that's now going to give us a nice kind of like glowing kind of like golden type of reflection that we would associate more with specific type of metals per se. So if I came over here and I took this, I'm going to call this golden shader over here, and I apply it to my helmet over here, you're going to see that this material over here will look kind of like nice and golden inside of my viewport over here, but it's also going to look fairly nice when we render this out. And again, I'm going to do just a quick test render over here to see what this material looks like, and you see that I've got this really nice golden type of finish like this. Uh, one of the things that we can do as well with golden type of materials, especially if I zoom into them like fairly closely like this over here, and again, I'm just gonna do a small little render region over here to save ourselves a little bit of time. You're gonna see that the roughness gives us a nice kind of like finish to what the material actually looks like. Uh, but if I wanted to enhance that ever so slightly, I could add on a bump map onto this material as well. Now, bump maps are quite a nice part of uh, creating materials inside of 3D, but they're gonna create a certain amount of surface displacement to our actual scene. 
Uh, to, one of the easy ways of doing this is that we can actually use either Maya noise files or we can use um, uh, uh, procedural textures inside of Maya to actually create our noise. And one of the things that I can do is that I can come into the shading network over here, choose the golden texture, and I can scrub down here into the bump node, which should be somewhere down here, bump mapping over there, and I can click over here and I can choose a specific type of file if I had one, or in this case, I'm just going to look for a noise filter over here. Now you're going to see that this noise filter is going to create very weird looking type of bubbles inside of my viewport. Some of these materials might not be visible until they're actually available in renderer, so we might have to check them. There also is an Arnold noise filter as well that you can use as well. But if I come over here and I click this little solo button over here, fingers crossed, I should be able to see what my material looks like either inside of my viewport or inside of my view over here. So again, I'm just trying to zoom in here on this little S button, which seems to be failing on me right now. There we go, turning on my trackpad. There we go. I can actually see this material being projected inside of my viewport by pressing this little S button, and I can also see it in my preview window over here. So this is what's going to allow me to configure what this looks like. And you're going to see that the noise pattern has various shapes. It has a wave dimension to it. It has different algorithms like Wispy, which is kind of like fairly cool for creating all types of billing type of shapes. But what I'm probably going to want to do is increase this frequency ratio over here. So you can see that what I'm doing is that I've got various, various, various types of kind of like shapes to this noise map which is being applied here. And again, thanks to the fact that I've made my UVs, I can actually see what this noise map actually looks like. So what I'm gonna do is come over here and just use a very standard kind of like uh, Perlin noise over here, which is a nice little starting place for me. And again, this bump map is going to be rendered out based on the look of this noise map over here. So I can make it more extreme or less extreme by changing the threshold. The amplitude will blur things down a little bit, and I think that with the ratio I can like create a greater sense of contrast over here. So I'm just going to boost up the contrast over here. The max depth, I'm going to leave it at 3 over here, and I think I might just play around a little bit with the frequency until I see a pattern that kind of like looks like that. That's okay for me. There we go. And then let's just dial that back down a little bit, just like so. So fingers crossed I should be able to see this now inside of my render per se. I can turn off the um, solo button over here. You see that I got a very extreme version of this. And if I render this out, I believe that I should have, again, a very extreme version of this render over here. So let's just have a look to see what this renders out like. And I can start seeing my noise is starting to affect my bump map quite substantially like that. Now, this bump map is too exaggerated. It almost looks like my material now is rusted, as you can see here. And actually what I want to do with the bump is, again, create a very, 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 very subtle effect per se. So inside of my rendering network over here, I have a property over here, which is called bump 2D over here. And inside this bump 2D node, I've got a bump depth, which can allow me to choose how strong this effect is. And the bump map can be very, very, very subtle. I'm gonna start off with a value of like 0.1 per se, and keep dialing it down to an extent. But if I bring back my render view over here, and I do like a little sample render, I hope I haven't moved that in the background per se, and I'm just gonna render this out wait for it for a few seconds and see if this bump is still too strong, which actually it does look too strong. So again, let's dial it down to 0.05 over here, really, really, really small value. You can see in my viewport, it's actually looking fairly nice that I've got this kind of like little ripple effect over here. So again, in combination with the roughness of the actual material itself, plus a tiny, tiny, tiny smidge of bump, I can start creating materials that actually look ever so slightly nice like that. And if I think that that material is not working, I can always come over here and select the connection point over here and just delete it for a second and just render what that material would look like without it. And I can keep playing around with the settings until I get a nice looking finish.
to the object that I want. So I'm going to keep playing with this until I find the correct amount of noise and the correct amount of bump that I need to add to my scene. So I played around with a few of the settings, ended up getting the look that I wanted. I actually swapped out the noise from using a Maya standard noise uh, network to a Arnold noise over here just that it was working a little bit better with kind of like this random pattern that I wanted to use. And what I did was I just typed in AIN to bring up an AI noise pattern over here. And the settings that I used was just, I increased the octaves over here to three, changed up the distortion and basically made the pattern to look like this. Importantly, I changed the scale so that the uh, noise would tile five times. So the size of the individual grains of noise would be much, 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 much smaller. And again, the one th nice thing about the Arnold noise as well is that it's got this little amplitude button over here which basically allows you to basically make the effect smaller or larger, less contrasty or more contrasty. And again it's just adding this little bit of nice golden type of section over here. Now when we're creating any of these materials you can always save images as well by going into file save image over here and again currently I have the color corrected version turned on over here and you can give this any name that you want. I've actually been saving various test renders just as JPEGs over here and you see that this render just took 16 seconds along with the actual helmet over here in order to make it like this. So in terms of finishing this image off, there's a few more changes that we could do, but let's talk a little bit about the render settings before I actually add some custom shaders, in, uh, some custom textures into here. So to finish off this scene over here, what I wanna do is choose a nice camera angle, and I wanna come over here and go into my Windows Outliner, and I wanna start rendering out an image to finish off. I'm gonna come over here and bring back by pressing Shift H on my keyboard, my wine bottle over here, and to frame my scene up, I can use this little viewport shader over here, which is the resolution gate over here, which currently you'll see that I have a half HD resolution up here, and whatever appears in this square will actually be the actual frame over here, that's what my renderer is gonna see when I press the render button over here. So again, it's the little circle button, which is up here, the little blue circle inside of the viewport filters over there. So I turn that off and I'm gonna say that, okay, this is the view that I actually want to render. I might wanna move it a little bit to the right so I can see those shadows inside of my scene in just a second. And I wanna start boosting up some of the properties inside of Arnold per se. So if I come over here and I bring up my render settings, I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna boost the overall quality to start up with it up to six over here. Now, specifically, I might have to keep debugging some things and looking at things inside of the diffuse channel, inside of the glossy channel, inside of the refractions, inside of the subsurface scattering, but you're gonna notice that a lot of these properties now I'm actually starting to use. If I was gonna be seeing some specific problems, say for example, inside the refraction panels as well, I could boost these up up, but I would not boost them up very much more than three, four to an extent. So the anti-aliasing is gonna be the overall setting for my scene, and then these specific settings over here, if I see problems with the subsurface scattering or I see problems with the indirect lighting, I'm gonna be playing around with these settings over here as well. So now my render is gonna take a lot longer to actually do, but I should be able to actually come up with quite a good image. So you're going to see that we've managed to render out our entire scene with quite a high level of quality in just two minutes over here. And there's still some noise in the actual shadows themselves. So I think that if you select your dome light and you boost up the volume samples just a little bit, you should be able to clear up the sampling of the shadows just a bit inside of our scene over here. And again, be careful with that. Don't boost this up too quickly. It was two iterations before. I think I'm going to do my second test with three and later on with four just to see if I can see an invisible impact in this area. And I'll probably do it by selecting just the area that has the shadows and rendering this out per se until it's perfect and smooth like so. Now, 
Importantly, when we're creating metals, there are some things that you guys have to be capable of doing by yourselves. Number one is that currently I've just applied one metallic color to this whole helmet, and it's always a good idea to design these materials kind of like with different types of effects and apply textures to different parts of the actual helmet. You can do that by methods just like when we were making this label, we were selecting areas of the helmet and you could apply different shaded um, materials onto those areas as well. Or if we came back into the hypershade, one of the things that we could do is that if I'm in my metallic shader over here, and let me just unsolo this layer for a second over there. There we go. I can come over here and select my golden texture over here. I can start introducing as well materials controlled by uh, that will help control the actual color, for example. So this golden material over here, I actually have pre-made a little file over here, which is a diffuse material. So if I come over here, I've made this earlier, which is a diffuse helmet base base TIFF, which is pretty much just a very simple Photoshop file over here, which I've actually colored and painted a little bit by hand. And I hit open over here. And again, this will take some of the properties that the golden material actually had, and it's gonna go ahead and it's going to apply a little bit of color to this material over here. So again, I'm gonna keep some of my properties from my actual golden material, but you're gonna see that the base color is now gonna come from this material over here instead of just using that golden color per se. So that can be very useful for us in terms of figuring out where things are. So again, I'm gonna come into here, and also inside of here, I can actually apply a specular color as well. So if I wanted to, I could start using this golden color and use a specific specular weight that comes from, again, a specific file as well. So again, I went into Photoshop very briefly, did a few little tricks of the trade over here, and I'm looking for specular helmet.tiff, and that again is just a black and white material that I basically created with a few filters here and there, and then basically just open this up. There we go. And now I should have this material. It's gonna be a little bit more glowing than the version before because it's a little bit stronger in terms of its tone. And what I should end up with is with a nice glossy controlled material over here, which now has a color coming from this little texture file over here. And it has a specular coming from this material over here. So importantly, it's very, very, very useful for us to actually have UVs already laid out in the objects. Even though we're working with shaders, per se, it's very important for us to think that we have to create UVs for the objects that we actually make in order to allow us to actually texture them in different ways. And you can see that I've got over here just some colors, some numbers that I've distorted over here. And again, all of these should create my final rendered helmet over here, which will have various properties. And you could do the same thing for the bump map and for other types of effects as well. So I'm gonna leave you guys today with, you know, designing your own helmets per se, try making different colors, try making different metals. Maybe you want to add some glass visors to it. Maybe you might want to make areas that glow. Have a look online and see how to make incandescent materials and other things as well. And start thinking about how you can apply different textures to your actual helmets. And I'm gonna show you very briefly what the actual you know final kind of render actually looks like but it's kind of like has plenty of space for improvement too okay so one of the things that i forgot to do was actually to add the color also to the specular color as well so just make sure that inside your actual material per se you actually have inside of the specular color actually assigned the same colors as the diffuse as well. Those could be slightly different as well, but remember that those colors are gonna inherit the base color of the actual material that you see over here. So again, you can design a whole set of looks for 
any type of material in terms of making some shaders. Even the standard Arnold material when exposed to light actually looks fairly nice. But I think it's really important in terms of getting the grips with shaders that we need to start looking more at these physically based renderings and inside Arnold they have their own set of options and ways of thinking about them that is going to be different from Mental Ray, that are going to be different from V-Ray as well, but are going to allow us to make very nice, very pleasing settings as well. So that's it for the tutorial for this week. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I've got a version of this tutorial for Mental Ray if you're interested in actually learning how some of the older technology used to tackle how to make metals and how to make glass as well. But importantly, we're going to keep going forward looking into lighting and materials and I can't wait to see you guys next week. Thank you very much for tuning in and spending some time with me learning a little bit about Maya and a little bit about Arnold. There is so much more that you know needs to be covered as well that hopefully I'm going to have enough time to keep hitting all of these tutorials and giving you guys one piece of information at a time so that you guys can keep learning and kind of like we will be tackling through all of the problems of how to create fantastic renderers hopefully get to V-Ray which I know that a lot of you guys have wanted as well so keep patient I promise you that all of this material is coming and thank you very much for reaching out to me on the YouTube channel as well with your comments, suggestions and everything. It's very, very, very heartwarming for me to actually know that you guys are out there and that you guys kind of like are interested in this type of material. So until next time, take care, keep learning and I will see you all next week with another mild tutorial. Take care. Bye bye.